Well, the Lord is good, and uh, we're going to uh, look into His Word this morning. Uh, we're talking uh, on a, in a series called How to Deal with How You Feel, and uh, today I'm talking about dealing with depression, dealing with depression. Depression can be a really incredibly intense, difficult thing. I have talked with people who were depressed and felt as if life was not worth living, felt as though they, didn't, they couldn't get up in the morning, there was nothing to get up for, uh, uh, emotions just all out of whack and up and down, and it can be an incredibly, incredibly isolating feeling. And I, I want to tell you that, that um, in all honesty, I don't particularly struggle with depression. I have never been really depressed. Now, I've been discouraged. Everybody's been there, right? We've been the short-term stuff. Um, although I did test a little bit depressive on the Taylor Johnson temperament analysis, inside joke with my wife there. So even though I, maybe I've never struggled with depression, especially on that, to that point that where it feels like it's so hopeless and so dark, it can even lead people to try to take their own life. It can be a tremendously difficult thing. But I do want to tell you that, um, that I, I want to be sensitive and careful to it. I don't want to fall into the trap of just dealing with it casually or like it doesn't matter or something like that. But I do want to, I do want to, to talk to you about it because um, there's a tremendous amount of depressive uh, issues and things going on today in our culture. And it's important to, as a Christian, as a believer, does God have anything to say about this? Well, I think He does, and I want to I want to talk about it this morning. Um, I want to start with right up front. I want to I want to bust five myths about depression. Okay, before we even really get into the scripture, I just want to bust some myths. All right, number one, if you're taking notes on your handout, I'm not going to be using PowerPoint this morning, but if you'll follow along, you know, track on your handout. By the way, Mike pointed out I got some of the handouts printed upside down this morning. All you have to do is stand on your head, and you can read it just fine. Okay, so um, number number one. Number one, so if, you, if I see you standing on your, on your head, I'll know why, okay? That's no problem. Number one, it's all your fault. You just need to snap out of it. That's, that's the first myth about depression that I want to bust, okay? It's all your fault. You just need to snap out of it. That's what your wife says, okay? Well, <laughs> this myth is popular with people who have never been depressed, right? <laughs> If you've never struggled with it, it's easy to just say, well, you know, sometimes I feel discouraged, but you just got to get yourself out of the nap of the neck and decide you're going to move forward anyway. You know what? Sometimes you're so depressed, you don't have bootstraps. You know what I'm saying? There are no bootstraps. You can't pull yourself up by them. It's, you can't always pull yourself out of depression as easily just by pulling yourself up any more than you could get yourself out of quicksand by pulling your hair. You know, you just, it's not going to work sometimes. It's not... It's a myth that it's all your fault and you just need to snap out of it. Let me give you the second one, though. The second myth is this. It's not something I can control. I'm a victim. Okay, that's, this one is popular with people who feel like they're losing the battle with depression. <laughs> if you've been depressed in this long time and it's been long term and it's difficult and you're, it, it's dark and it's just easy to feel like I'm just a victim, there's nothing I can do. Um, let, let me give you a stat a statistic that should be kind of strangely, weirdly encouraging. Are you ready? People born since 1945 are 10 times as likely to struggle with depression as people born before 1945. <laughs> the 19... <19 laughs> It's statistically, that's true. Now, there's been all sorts of, uh, of thought about why that is, but statistically it's true, and it's not explainable just by uh, people are going to their doctor more, it's being diagnosed more often, or it's, you know, it's not just, in fact, they actually, in that study, they actually controlled for some measure of that, like how frequently it's, it's diagnosed and things like that, and it still came out 10 times as, you're 10 times as likely if you're born after 1945 to struggle with depression as somebody who was born before it. Now, that's astounding. Like, that's an astounding uh, idea that you're a thousand percent more likely to, to struggle with depression 
if you're born after 1945, but here's what, it, here's what I think it does mean. I think it does mean for sure this, that society has changed. The world has changed. The world is not like it was before 1945. Some things have, have changed, and here's a list of a few that I've got on your, on your handout. A breakdown in the extended family. Since before 1945, families are a lot more likely to be broken and shattered in and, and his kids, her kids, uh, single-parent families, uh, divorce, all these sorts of things are a lot more likely. A dispersal of communities. Um, community has become very artificial in many ways. Um, it used, the old saying, we used to talk over the back fence and now we build privacy fences, right? Now, I'm not against privacy fences. I've got one. I'm just saying that the, the point is that we tend to kind of these days kind of barrier ourselves and separate ourselves from actual relationships with people. And uh, another one is an increased focus on material wealth. Um, it wasn't so much of a celebrity culture before 1945, was it? You know, now we get to be, in, we have the Kardashians inflicted on us on a regular basis, and <laughs> if you allow yourself to be exposed to that at least, and uh, it, it's, that's different. It didn't used to be that way, an incredible focus on material wealth. The for, another one there is a overwhelming prevalence of news media. In other words, not only do we have an exceedingly uh, uh, exceeding amount of focus on material wealth, now we know how everyone is doing. You used to just know how people in your town were doing, right, and your neighbors, but now you know how the lifestyles of the rich and famous really are, and it makes it, it there's a lot of, and not only that, but bad news. And you know the old saying, you know the saying in news, if it bleeds, it leads, right? That's the, they literally have a saying in the news media, if it bleeds, it leads. What are they saying? If it's bad news, we put it right up front. Because they know they'll keep you. You're more likely to say, oh, oh, isn't that horrible? And not change the channel, right? <laughs> You're more likely to just stay with the newscast if it's bad news. And so there's, there's an implicit bias built in and this overwhelming. It used to be that if you lived in the middle part of America, you didn't know about the tornadoes that happened all over the rest of the country. Or if you lived on the East Coast, you didn't know about the, the things in, that happened in Oklahoma on a daily basis, but now we do. And so years ago, you wouldn't have heard maybe for your whole life about the guy that drove through Times Square, killed one person and put 22 in the hospital well, on the, by driving his car through a crowd. You wouldn't even have known that back then, and now we know everything that happens, not only here, but around the world. And it's tremendous. It can be this pressure that weighs down on you. Fifthly is an increase, an increase in focus on the self. Like, I have to be happy as much as possible right now. And if you're, I promise, if you're thinking, I have to be happy as much as possible right now, you're like Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin and Hobbes is my favorite comic strip of all time. And there's one where Calvin says, says to, uh, to Hobbes, they're on summer vacation, he says, Hobbes, right now, we're losing precious time of summer vacation. We ought to be having fun right this minute. We, we ought to be asking ourselves every second, am I having the maximum amount of fun I could possibly be having? And Hobbes says, I didn't realize having fun was so much work. And he said, oh yeah, when you're serious about it, it's not much fun at all. <laughs> Why? Because we have to feel like, I have to be happy right now. Right now I have to be happy. Why am I not? And it leads to this overwhelming focus on self. <laughs> and then you feel depressed because you're not happy or something. You know. All right, let's keep going. Number three. Well, let me, let me give you the blank there. But if this is true, here's why I think this should be encouraging. Okay? You say, Daryl, that's not encouraging at all. That's like telling me exactly why I'm depressed. Oh, this is terrible. I'm going to be out go out more depressed than I came in. Well, let me, let me tell you, if this is true, you can find ways to fight against those new realities. If, if it's true that culture has changed and the world has changed, maybe you can find ways to push back against those kind of realities. You don't have to, you don't have to participate in the way the world has changed. You don't have to. You can choose to be a person who has margin and peace and safety and, and, and relationship. You can fight against this kind of stuff in your own life. It's, it's, if it's true that it's not just, well, it's biological, there's nothing I can do. It's the GMOs in my vegetables, you know, if it's not. All right. Maybe you can fight against, maybe you can fight against these 
kinds of things. Number three, myth number three. We're going to bust another one. Ready? Here we go. Christians don't struggle with depression. <laughs> Somebody who was wrong told me that. Yeah. Christians don't struggle with depression. It's one of the great myths that if you're a Christian, you ought to be happy all the time. Just happy. Everything is good. Everything is praise the Lord, brother. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. It doesn't always feel like praise the Lord, brother. Can we, just, can we just be honest about that? Can we bring that out and say, it's not always. Because we go to church and you feel pressure to go, how are you? Fine. Fine. I'm well. Thank you. And in the side, you're going, oh, 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 yeah. But we have to act like everything's fine because if I don't, I'm not a good Christian. And that's, that's not true. Christians do struggle, genuinely struggle with depression. It's possible. In fact, let me give you some Bible characters who struggle with depression. Job, right? Job felt like dying. He was hurting. His family had forsaken him. He lost all his kids. He lost all his money. He was, oh, it's painful. And he was like, I just wish God would kill me. Right? You're not, if you felt that way, you're like, oh, that's terrible. Why did I feel that way? Not to drop names, but Job, the godliest man of his time, felt that way too. All right. So Job, Paul, Dave, Isaiah, David, Elijah, Jeremiah. Anybody have mood swings? Anybody have mood swings? You need to read the book of Jeremiah because this dude was a basket case when it comes to like. In fact, there's one of his prophecies. I'm reading along and he's like, praise the Lord. He's so amazing. He delivers the poor and the needy out of the hand of the oppressor. Cursed be the day that I was born. <laughs> Like, that's the next verse, literally. He's like, oh my goodness, it's so, God's so amazing. Oh, I wish I could die. All right. <laughs> if you've ever felt like you were on top one day and then you're so down the next day, I guess I must not be a Christian, stop, Jeremiah, okay? Jeremiah, just remember that name because there's a guy that God used mightily and powerfully who had incredibly discouraging days, dark days. Peter, and many more. Now, here's some famous Christians and some other famous people who clearly struggle with depression. Martin Luther, Abraham Lincoln. Martin Luther, you might not know, not Martin Luther King Jr., um, though he perhaps did too, I don't know. But Martin Luther is the, is the great reformer, one of the most, ten most influential Christians of all time uh, in Germany, a powerful man of God, and struggled powerfully with depression. Um, so much so one time that there's a place, he was locked up, a prisoner feared for his life, uh, he was locked up in a castle uh, in, in, in uh, Worms, and he's, he's uh, there, and, and he, there's, a, a, there's a big blot of ink on the wall, where the story is that Martin Luther felt like he saw the devil, and he threw an ink well at him, and it smashed up against the wall, and uh, there's a big blot of ink on the wall, he, but out of that difficult, dark time comes uh, it, the, the German translation of the Bible um, and from Latin and all these incredible things. Um, keep going. Mar Abraham Lincoln, uh, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill struggled regularly with depression. The great World War II leader, he called it the black dog. He said the black dog would come to visit, and uh, he's, he struggled regularly with that. Uh, Samuel Logan Bringle, the leader of the Salvation Army and uh, a powerful man of God, struggled greatly with depression at times. Um, Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest, most famous preachers of all time, a uh, powerful preacher of, uh, in the 1800s in London. John and Charles Wesley. Now, I'll stop here because John and Charles Wesley founded the Methodist movement, and um, I just want to just highlight them just for a moment. John Wesley um, was a, a tremendous man of God. And he was not truly saved until he was in his 30s, but he became a powerful force for God, preached all over the world, organized a movement, was used by God to organize a movement that leaped the Atlantic and, and millions, literally millions of people over the course of, of uh, the next century were saved by the Methodist revival. Now, in the process of this, John Wesley once wrote a letter to his brother, Charles, and he wrote in that letter, he was feeling so down, here's what he wrote. He said, I do not love God. I never did. He felt like I, it must have all been fake, is what he was feeling like. All that stuff, I must have been fake. I just was, 
What was he feeling? He was feeling depressed. He was like, I never did love the Lord. I just don't even think it's real. I'm not... Wow. Charles Wesley one time wrote a poem. Charles was a very melancholy sort of man who, who was very deeply emotional. And he wrote a poem. Charles Wesley wrote incredible hymns, amazing poetry that we still sing to this day. But he wrote a hymn one time, a poem that never made it into the songbook. And here's why. Because it says, Ah, lovely appearance of death, how beautiful a dead corpse doth appear. That's the opening line of the song. He was at a funeral, and he saw the corpse, and he just was so like, oh, if only I could be that person and could fly away and be free from all my troubles. That's what the rest of the song says. Now, you're not going to find that one in our hymn book, but at that time, Charles was struggling with depression and discouragement, and it felt like it would be easier, it would be easier to just go on and be with Jesus, if you've ever felt like that. I'm just saying, this is real stuff. These are not like just dime store Christians. These are mighty, powerful people who knew the Lord and they struggled with depression. Let's keep going. Number four, if I can find, myth number four, if I can find the right combination of tools, I'll be perf- continually sunny and personality. If I can just find the right combination, if I can just find the right diet and the right uh, workout and the right medication and the right this, I'll just be continually happy and sunny in my disposition. Not necessarily true. Not necessarily true. In fact, um, I I don't have time to stay there, but uh, Art of Manliness, the website Art of Manliness, did a really great series on depression here a while back. Uh, Brett McKay, their founder and the main author there, has struggled with it, and he said, I finally accepted the fact that there would never be a time when I had said I could say I had cured my depression and I was going to be a cheery, upbeat guy, and I decided to make peace with my gloomy temperament. So he's like, he's like, you know, I'm just a little more of a gloomy sort of person, and I'm just going to be okay with that. And he said, ironically, rather than looking for endless new cures and trying to beat myself up they hadn't worked, I was able to concentrate on making generally healthy practice more of a habit, and I got happier by giving up on being happy all the time. (laughs) It's an interesting idea, right? This myth that you're always going to be like, I've met some people who felt like if they, just, if they could just pray a little more and read the Bible a little more, they'd be like this the rest of the day. Not necessarily, and that's okay. Right? Make peace with that. Number five, normal people are happy all the time. That's another myth. Normal people are happy all the time. <laughs> they're not normal, she said. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, if they're happy all the time, they're not normal. Now I'm going to have to preach a sermon next week to get the happy people and to talk to them. That's right, that's right. All right, I'm going to move on to keep for the sake of time. Let's keep moving. Ready? Here we go. What contributes to depression among Christians? Let me give you some, some things that contribute. I'm not saying these, it's all this, I'm not going to the it's all your fault thing. I'm just saying here's some things that contribute. Okay, number one, indecision and inaction. Indecision and inaction. David Seaman says, you could be using the same energy that you, that you, you have not to put off the decision, but to make it and manage it. And he said, the more you wait to make decisions, the more you decide, I just don't know if I can, the more you wait to do that, the more it piles up, and eventually the pile feels so big that it feels like you'll never be able to climb over top of it. So indecision eventually contributes to depressive things, indecision and inaction. Number two, anger that hasn't been dealt with, anger that hasn't been dealt with. Again, David Siemens, I have a few copies of his book uh, left, uh, Healing for Damaged Emotions. If you'd like a copy, $9 a piece. I ordered several of them because I was going to be preaching this series and to just give you an extra way to, to, to work through some things. Anger that hasn't been dealt with. David Siemens says the most concise depre- de- definition of depression I've ever heard is this. Depression is frozen rage. <laughs> he said if you have deep, unsolved, undealt with anger toward past situations, it will result 
in depression. It'll happen to you. It will be, if you haven't forgiven and you haven't worked through some things from the past and you're angry about it still, it will happen. Number three, focusing on injustices in your life. Focusing on injustices in your life. I have found in talking with people that most of the people that I have talked with that are depressed, most of them have a tremendously strong sense of injustice. They have a really strong justice meter in their, in their heart. And by the way, this is not a bad thing, okay? Every reformer you've ever heard of, every person who really made a difference in the world probably had a really good strong justice meter in their life. But what I am saying is this, that if you can surrender your sense of justice to the Lord, that it becomes a benefit. But if you use your sense of justice to make sure that everybody pays you what they owe you, it'll lead you toward depression. I, I have, I've had so many people who are struggling with depression. You try to get into it, and what you get into is, that was not right. The way they did it, that, they, I just don't understand how they can do that. It was not right, and they shouldn't do this. And why is it that they always do this? I just don't, when, when you get into it, that sort of thing, it, it, it's a, the justice meter, instead of letting it go in forgiveness, the justice meter is pegged out in the red zone all the time. And eventually you'll be, it, it'll wear you out, and you'll be depressed. It'll be a difficult thing. Number four, comparisons with other people. David Siemens tells a story of two sisters, Mary and Martha, were completely opposites. Mary was outgoing, vivacious, blonde. Martha was quiet, talented, and brunette. They were sisters, and they grew up together. And he said, Martha came to me, to David Siemens, to talk to her about a dating, talk to him about a dating relationship. She said, it's the best dating relationship I've ever had in my life so far. And she said, but it's also bringing out a huge parcel of emotional problems, a lot of depression and an angry, fault-finding sort of attitude toward the young guy that she was dating. She wanted to love him. She was learning to love him, but she felt shocked because she said, I also feel like I want to pick at him and I want to fix everything and I want to... And she said, I don't know why that is, and she's trying to figure out. So they started talking about it. As she looked back she realized this was her dating pattern from the past as well. And it scared her. And as we talked, a lot of deep resentments came to the surface and she began to deal with them. Some of those feelings were toward mother and father, and those for, were forgiven so love could replace the anger. But one day it became very obvious Martha's real problem was Mary. And all of a sudden, the angry memories she had marched across the screen of her imagination as far back as she could remember. Her life was a life of comparisons, comparisons by teachers, by parents, by friends, by preachers, and by neighbors. As we began praying for the healing of those memories, and as she told God she was willing to forgive and be forgiven and let God change her feelings, it was as if in a moment of time in prayer, the Holy Spirit pulled back the curtain, revealing to Martha a chain of insights, and in her prayer, she began crying out, Oh, Lord! I see everything I have ever said or thought or done or aimed at has been in reference in comparison to Mary. And Mary has been ruling my life. She's been my obsession, and she's almost taken over your place in my life. As if everything she tried to do was trying to be Mary. I got to beat Mary. I got to match Mary. I got to. Martha had never chosen a dress or a course in college or a boyfriend or set a goal or made any choice without the feeling that she was competing with Mary. And all the hidden hurts and anger had ha had her emotionally enslaved to their older sister. It was a struggle to let go and forgive what she felt were injustices of the comparisons and favoritisms. And Martha had a prayer battle there that went on for a, almost an hour. Well, I'm sorry, well over an hour. At the end, she was exhausted and so was I. But at the end, she truly forgave. She was released and set free from the hateful, competitive, angry little girl that was still trapped inside trying to match Mary. If you, if you live your life always comparing. In fact, the scripture actually says this. It says, 
we dare not make ourselves of the number that compare ourselves among ourselves and measure ourselves by ourselves because those who do so are not wise. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 13. You can't compare. Comparison. Number five, significant physical or life, significant physical or emotional life trauma. Trauma. I say this one to last because it's, it is one that sometimes you simply cannot control. It's, uh, things happen. Right? Life stuff happens. Did you know that life causes stress? Even good things cause stress? Right? Like even vacation causes stress. You know that, right? You ever felt that feeling of like, whew, I'm going to have to go home and relax. <laughs> if you ever have felt that feeling when you've been away from home, you know that even good things that you look forward to cause a certain amount of stress and difficulty because your brain processes stress and excitement in exactly the same way. This is true. Exactly the same hormones, exactly the same area of the brain lights up when you're under stress and when you're excited. It's exactly the same. So no matter what the stressor is, whether it's positive or negative, it lights up those areas of the brain, and that part of the brain can get exhausted in just dealing with the realities of the stress. It can. And so sometimes the best thing you can do sometimes is just absolutely rest. I want to tell you a quick story, and that is from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, in 1 Kings chapter 18, there's a powerful story where uh, Elijah, the prophet of God, comes to the, the, the mountain of Mount Carmel, and he calls all Israel together. They've been worshiping Baal, and God said, because you have followed Baal, this false god, I'm not going to allow it to reign, and it didn't for three years. Now, at the end of three years, you can imagine how horrible life was. I mean, everything is dying. The brooks, the rivers are dry, the cattle are dying, the crops have failed. And so everybody gets together. There's nothing else to do. So they all get together, and Elijah says, all right, bring all the prophets of Baal, 450. He says, sacrifice to Baal, and I will sacrifice to the Lord, and let the God that answers by fire. We're not going to light the sacrifice on fire. We're going to let the God who answers. We're both going to pray, and God ask God to send fire from heaven down on the sacrifice. And the God that answers with fire, that's going to be the real God. So, Wow, this epic contest uh, is set up. The prophets of Baal try all day long, and Elijah sits there and laughs at them and mocks and makes fun. At the end of the day, Elijah says, all right, my turn, you've had your chance. And about toward evening, he rebuilds the altar. They pour water over it just to be sure that everybody knows he's not doing some kind of trick. And then he prays, in English, 63 words, and God answers with fire. I mean, and he really answers. It's not like a candle flame. It's like that burns up the rocks and the sacrifice and the wood and the water and the dirt. I mean, there's a smoking crater where the, where the sacrifice was. And Elijah, I mean, clearly won, right? And the people fall down on the, on the, floor, on the ground before, them and before the Lord and say, The Lord is God amazing story, right? The ultimate pinnacle of victory. The whole nation has now been turned back to the Lord. And the next thing we find, Jezebel comes and says, the, the wicked queen, she says, tomorrow you're a dead man. There's no way you live 24 hours, Elijah. I'm coming for you. She sends out her soldiers. They're searching. They're looking. And Elijah goes on the run. And he runs. And he gets out into the wilderness and flops down underneath a tree. And he is so exhausted by the conflict. Now, it's been good, like it had a good resolution, right? But he's so drained. He's depressed, and he says, oh, Lord, this is enough, okay? Kill me. Take away my life. What, am I better than all my fathers? They're in the grave. I'm not any better than them putting me in the grave. I'm done. I got nothing else. Stick a fork in me, Lord. I'm done. And God does something really interesting. What he says is, come on, Elijah, snap out of it. No, he doesn't. 
Look at the story. Let me tell you what he did. What he did. We've, we've done this before, right? Wanda and I have had this conversation before when she was really discouraged one time. Let me tell you, here's what happened. God said nothing. In fact, he laid Elijah down and let him sleep. He did. He let him sleep. Now, when you're discouraged, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is go take a nap. You know why? Because Elijah's brain had been processing all this conflict and all this excitement and all this powerful action, and he was exhausted, and he had nothing left to give. And God said, sleep, and he slept, and he slept for a good long time, and then God, check this out, God woke him up, sent an angel, he woke him up, and you know what he did then? He gave him a big long lecture about how he needed to snap out of it and smile. No, he didn't. He fed him. He fed him. He said, here, here's, in fact, he already had the food prepared, which is amazing, right? If you're depressed, you're like, could we just have meals on wheels for the depressed? Could we do, this would be amazing. Have an angel, bring me some food, and we're going to be fine, right? So he, he, he gives him food. It's all prepared. He wakes him up. It's like, eat. So he ate, and then he slept again. No, really. God still hasn't lectured him, hasn't done anything. He's just taken care of him. He slept, he woke up, he ate, he went back to sleep again, and then he woke him up and fed him, and then he said, and it says, and he went on the strength of that bread for 40 days. So he left, God fed him some really amazing food, and he walked, and he goes out into the wilderness, out into the desert, and he goes out there and says, um, I, Lord, I'm still depressed. He goes in a cave, he's down, he's depressed, he's discouraged, Lord, kill me. And you know what God did? God gave him a fresh vision of his power, okay? It says there was an earthquake and a mighty wind and all these things, but it also says, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. It was not in the fire. It was not in the, well, it wasn't there. God's presence wasn't there. What, what's, God was doing it, but he wasn't healing through it. You know, Here's the thing. God's power and presence isn't always in the fancy, amazing, ah, hurrah moments. It's not always that. Sometimes God is in the ordinary, the quiet, the normal, the regular life, getting up and eating and sleeping and doing right and following the Lord and letting Him talk with you. And then it says, after the fire and the storm, and the, there came a still, quiet voice. God was in the voice, the quiet voice. And he said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And then check this out. He didn't lecture him first. He listened to him. And Elijah said, I've been very, very zealous and passionate for the Lord, and I'm the only one left, and there's nobody except me, and now I just want to die. And blessed, they're trying to find me, and they're trying to kill me. And I, He just dumped it on God. Now listen, hear me out now. Sometimes you're going to need to go dump it on God. Okay? Eat, sleep, and go dump it on God. Right? And then eat and sleep and go tell God some more stuff. Sometimes you've got to get it out and process and be honest with Him. What, you think God doesn't know anyway? You, you think He wasn't aware of how you were feeling? He already knew. Why don't you just go ahead and tell Him? Right? Admit it. Yeah. Right. Okay. After that, the next thing God did is going to plug right into my next section. And so I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, and then we're going to jump right into the next section. All right, so here we go. What God did next is He said, now, Elijah, get up. Okay, get up. There comes a point, even in depressive issues, where you've got to get up. Okay, you've got, you got to get up, and you can take action. And, and God said to Elijah, get up. You're not the only one. He said, I have 7,000 other people in Israel right now who have never bowed to Baal, have never kissed a Baal idol, not one time. And he said, you need companionship. And he sends him out and he says, I want you to go out. I want you to anoint Elisha, who was to be his successor. Anoint him as a a prophet in your place. You need somebody to go with you. You need somebody to walk with you. In fact, let's look at this. Okay, an action plan for dealing with depression from Scripture and science. Ready? Here we go. Number one, seek out and participate in authentic Christian community. All right. I know 
when you're depressed, you don't feel like being with people. I know that's true. I, I know it's so. I know it feels like just let's turn over and let's put a pillow over our head and not do anything and not talk and not pray with people and not talk to people and not face to face anytime, ever, anywhere. I know that's true. But if you'll move toward community, it will help heal. Let me explain. Here's why. Three reasons. Ready if you're taking notes. Number one, God is, first of all, God is community. God is community. Did you know that? The Trinity. Right? God is not just one. He is also three. There has never been a time where God, the Father, was alone. Before any humans were created, before any angels existed, there was never a time from all eternity where God was alone. Did you know that? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Continually in an affirming, continually in a regular relationship with, with Himself, a loving, affirming, joyous, happy community. You're created in God's image. You need community. God never meant for you to be alone. In fact, in the creation, the first thing God ever said was not good. He said, it's not good that man should be alone. Yeah. You weren't created to be alone. And you say, well, I, I, you know, I have my kids. Okay, look, I've got seven of those. And let me just tell you, it's not always like, like you can't always make that your community. Okay, you can't do it. Because after a while... I'm not going to say they're going to just contribute to depression. I'm just going to say they're not going to pull you out of it. All right? Let's just, say, let's just be honest here. It's not going to be that way. They may be a blessing to you. They may help. They may, but you need authentic Christian community. You need people. Secondly, the second reason why I think this is important is because we already have too much artificial, or let's go fake, fake community, which actually isolates. You know what fake community looks like? Tell me. Facebook, Facebook thank you. All right. Now, don't get me wrong. I've got 3,000 friends on Facebook, okay? And I check Facebook, and I get on there, and I, and, and I see other people's drama. I do, but it's like, it's not real. It's not real, you do know that they put filters on their photographs before they put them on there, right? It's not real. You know they cut like the edges of their photos to make sure that you don't get the mess that's over here on the side, right? At least I do. You know they turn their good side toward the camera, right? It's not real. In other, I'm, not saying, I'm not preaching against Facebook. What I am saying is that if you're looking for authentic Christian community that helps heal the deep darkness of depression, Facebook's probably not going to cut it. That's what I'm saying. All right? Let's keep going. Because genuine, genuine love increases the odds of your recovery. Genuine love increases the odds of of your recovery. I don't have time to spend a lot of time on this right here, but that is in Exodus chapter 17. There's a neat story where God's people are fighting, and Moses goes out, he raises the rod up, and as long as he's got his arms up, the, the, the Israelites are winning. But now, have you ever tried to hold your arms up like this for very long? After a while, you're like, okay, <laughs> something's got to give. And Moses' arms got tired, and he would let his arms down to rest, and Israel would start losing the battle. So what they did is they brought him a rock. He sat down on the rock, and then they got two guys next to him to hold his hands up. <laughs> now, you may be like, okay, seriously, why in the world would God do that? Now, hear me out here. God didn't give that because God couldn't help them win without his hands up. Let me tell you why God gave us that story. Because if you want to move toward victory, one is too small of a number to win. Okay? You're not going to do this by yourself. You need God with you. You need Christians with you. You need somebody. When things get heavy, it's time to get somebody to help you hold it up, y'all. All right? Okay. Let's keep going. Number two, create a habit of thanksgiving. A habit of gratitude. You could say it that way too. There was a study recently, actually two studies recently, where they took a group of students 
and they ask them to do a one sentence, a short gratitude journal every day for two weeks. I'm sorry, two months. All it was was one sentence about five different things they were thankful for every morning. Okay, write down one sentence about five different things you're thankful of. It can be anything. At the end of the two months, the control group versus the group that wrote, the, the gratitude journal, the group that wrote in the journal reported feeling more optimistic, they felt happier, they reported fewer physical problems, they were more likely to report working out, they fell asleep more quickly at night, they slept longer and woke up feeling more refreshed. Now, I don't, I don't just want to like go overboard, but I think I just proved the case right there, okay? You, <laughs> you need, you need to, to, to develop a ha- habit of gratitude. So when you get up in the morning and it is dark, and I don't mean outside, I mean in here. Sit down and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Even if I'm not feeling this overwhelming, warm, fuzzy feeling right now, I thank you for, thank you for that sunlight coming through that falls on that spot on the, on the floor right there. Thank you for that warm Oklahoma wind. Thank you. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for that flower right there. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for it. Develop all of that, develop that, and I promise you, it will make a difference. I'm not saying, we're not talking about cure and you're always going to be happy, remember? What I'm saying is that it will help, it will lift, it will encourage, and over the course of time, you develop a a habit like that, an attitude of gratitude, and it will make a difference in your life. Now, on the back of your handout, let me just tell you this, I've never done this before, but I had way too much content for today, way too much. On the back of your handout, it goes all the way from three all the way up through nine, and I didn't have time to put it in, I'm I'm not going to make you sit through it, but it is on the church Facebook page and it's on our YouTube channel, okay? (laughs) So if you want, I pre-recorded it, so if you're a glutton for punishment, you can go on and watch the rest of it, or if you say, you know, I'm really struggling with this depressive thing and I want to learn some more practical ways to deal with it, you can go on Facebook or on uh, on the YouTube channel uh, that's there on the handout and you can check that out and, uh, and watch that video, which just should be just posted just in the last little bit here. I was uploading it while we were d- going through the sermon, all right? So if, uh, if you'd like to do that, you may. I'd like to wrap up today with prayer. Let's bow our heads together as we pray.